This video might blow your mind, subtly stated. Dr. David Sinclair, famous Harvard researcher of aging, just released a new study wherein he describes a new theory of aging. I asked the physiotic community if you wanted me to cover the study and break it down for you, and clearly the answer was yes, because, well, here we are. I will describe the study, the solutions used, and then offer some takeaways based on this new information. As forewarning, this is a, going to be a heavy molecular biology video, and I'll do my best to make things as abundantly clear, but molecular biology is a heavy world, although filled with millions of fascinations. And I'll be choosing my words wisely, thereby eliminating certain aspects a fellow molecular biologist may find important, but I do not feel adds significantly to the story and would do more to confuse than clarify. So, just be aware that I'm not covering everything, just the highlights. Now, you may have heard before that aging is caused by the accrual of genetic mutations. As we age, we develop damage to our genes that make up our genome. That is the prevailing theory, but certainly there are other additions like those related to mitochondrial health, metabolic changes, telomere shortening, demon possessions, and the like, although the last one may be less scientifically popular. All of them have varying levels of evidence in their favor, but Dr. Sinclair's gigantic new study adds a new player into the mix, and the data paints a compelling story. Previous work by the Sinclair lab has been performed in yeast, but this study uses a mammalian model, meaning it uses mice to test if aging is caused through a different mechanism. In his study, he used genetically manipulated mice that contain a specific gene in their genome. This gene contains the information for the production of a protein called IPPOL. This type of protein, called a nuclease, serves a specific function, that function being to cut DNA. So if this protein is produced from the information held in its gene, it will begin to bind specific genes and break the DNA, creating a need for the DNA to be mended. The reason for this genetic manipulation of these mice is to specifically create DNA damage, like the DNA mutation theory of aging would indicate. But Dr. Sinclair's lab did something unique. They have an inducible version of this action. That means that the researchers can turn on when this nuclease, IPPOL, is produced and when it is not. They do that by exposing the mice to a drug, and this drug will activate the production of IPPOL, and when the drug is taken away from the mice, IPPOL will no longer be created. So to test if this works, the researchers took cells from these mice and exposed the cells to this inducible drug. Here, we have a measure of the cell's nucleus, where the majority of the genes are housed. So the blue is the stain for DNA. In green, there is a stain for IPPOL, the protein expressed by the cells of these mice. And in red, we have a marker for DNA damage. Now, the CRE is known as the control. These are the cells that are taken from the mice that do not have the IPPOL genetic addition to their genome. The ice are the cells from the mice that have had this IPPOL genetic manipulation. Now, the researchers have exposed both sets of cells to the drug that we discussed earlier called tamoxifen. So what do we see? Well, we see that in the control cells, the CRE cells, there is no production of IPPOL. And why would we see any production? They do not possess the gene for its production. Additionally, they do not incur DNA damage. However, there is a different story when looking at the ice cells. So these are the cells that do have the ability to produce IPPOL. And they certainly do produce the protein, as seen in green, when exposed to the drug. Additionally, and predictably, they experience more DNA damage, as shown by the red specks. So fair enough, we now know that the drug does what it is supposed to do, and it does not affect the control, the Cree cells. But remember, I mentioned that the researchers want this to be temporary. They want to be able to turn it on and off at will. So what happens when these cells have the drug removed? 96 hours later, both conditions show no IPPOL expression, 
and even more importantly, no DNA damage. This identifies that IP Paul expression can be turned off, but that the DNA damage caused can also be healed. If you didn't know that, that's pretty cool in its own right, because yes, our cells have various DNA repair machinery that they charge with the job of repairing our DNA damage. The following question should be, are there any mutations that are caused by this DNA damage? You see, just because we have DNA repair machinery, proteins, does not mean that they perfectly repair the DNA. Sometimes they make mistakes. So according to the mutation theory of aging, these cells should experience more mutations because they undergo more DNA damage. Or at least it's a strong possibility. So the researchers check if there are any differences across over 100,000 genes between the Cree control mice and the ice genetically manipulated mice. And they find no difference. We would see a difference in the read counts as shown here, but the two colors, so blue for the Cree control and red for the ice genetically manipulated mice overlap, indicating no difference. Okay, so we know that these genetically manipulated mice incur much more DNA damage than their control counterparts, but they do not incur more mutations. So then what changes? Their epigenome. You may have heard of epigenetics before. It's a field akin to genetics, but looks at the tags applied to the genes. You see, before we were looking at the bare genes, but our genes are rarely bare. They're often tagged with different molecular tags. These tags can influence if the gene is expressed or repressed, allowing or disallowing the production of the protein it holds the information for. Dr. Sinclair's lab measured the genetic code inside the cells and found no differences, implying that the DNA repair did an accurate job, but they found something vastly different when looking at the epigenetics, the tags applied to genes. Looking at almost 90 genes related to aging, they found that the ice mice, which as a reminder, isn't as cool as the vanilla ice's song, ice, ice, baby. Uh, because these animals are the ones with the IP Paul genetic ma manipulation. Okay, vanilla ice isn't cool either, but it's preferable to mass genetic damage. Anyway, they found that the ice animals experienced significant changes in their epigenetic profile, meaning the explored genes have vastly older genetic tagging than their Cree control counterparts. Wow. This means that even if the DNA is repaired perfectly, the genetic tags applied are changed, potentially leading to disastrous consequences. So what are these potential consequences? Well, as just a few examples, the mice become far more frail just from one exposure to mass DNA damage. Even though the genes themselves would be considered healthy, unmutated, their body is now far more frail. Not only that, they look and behave much older over the same length of time compared to the control mice. Just look at that. The mice at the same age, but the ice mice look horrible. They simply age much faster than the control mice. This held true in measures of inflammation, metabolism, mitochondrial size, brain function, and many other measures that would require me explaining each one of these panels. And although I'd love to do that for you, this video is already going to be complex enough, especially as we get to the solution. Next, Dr. Sinclair's lab wanted to dig deeper into the epigenetic tag differences. So they compared the epigenetic differences between the older mice and the ice genetically manipulated mice and found similar epigenetic profiles. Now you can see that displayed on this heat map of thousands of genes. The similarity in color gradient, more red in those top sections, is more similar between the 24-month-old mice, so very old mice, and the ice mice that simply underwent one quick burst of genetic damage without mutational burden. So their epigenome correlates well. Next, 
Actually, when I say next, I've absolutely skipped over about 20 other experiments just to be transparent. So next, the researchers decided to try to find a way to reverse these effects. To do that, they relied on some data that they had collected for a recent study that they published wherein they reversed blindness in mice. In that study, they exposed mice to a virus that contains a new genetic manipulation. I realize when you hear the word virus that you may be thinking it's a bad thing, but they actually exposed the mice to some helpful genes. So the infection was designed to implant new helpful genes into the mice. These genes are known as the Yamanaka factors, which have been identified to make cells become more like their younger selves. Get it? Selves. Anyway, <laughs> these four genes were discovered in an attempt to create stem cells. It's a whole other story that we can't get into, but they also have the effect of reversing some of the effects of aging. As I mentioned previously, the researchers had injected these genes into mice that were varying degrees of blind and were able to reverse their blindness. But more specifically, they changed their epigenetic profile as seen here. The DNA methylation, which is an epigenetic tag, was reduced when the mice were exposed to these genes. So with that reasoning in mind, can they reverse more than just blindness according to the new study? Well, looking at the overall epigenetic profile, we see some levels of reversal from the initial IP Paul genetic manipulation, the ice mice, with the exposure to the Yamanaka factors, as shown with the green dots being lower than the red dots. Each dot represents a sample from a mouse. Then, in a specific measure of an epigenetic tag on a DNA-related protein called a histone, there are reduced levels of this tag in the ice mice compared to the control, but a recovery of the tag when the Yamanaka factors are expressed. This data, nor any of the other data I didn't cover, does not act as a perfect proof of the complete reversal of epigenetic aging, or aging as a whole, but it's some preliminary evidence that does tilt things in the reverse direction. Still, what does that all mean for you and me, humans, at least I think? <laughs> it means that the mutation theory of aging can still be true, and there's plenty of evidence for it. So it doesn't disprove anything in that regard, but it does show that aging can happen independently of mutation overload on our genes. It can happen through irregular genetic tagging, known as epigenetics. Normal patterns of genetic control can be disrupted, even if genes themselves are undisturbed. That's a really cool finding, but you might be wondering what it means for you. Well, as you are likely aware, you may have already posted a comment telling me that I shouldn't be wasting my time on an animal study. Well, this is an animal study, and it is difficult to translate to application without appropriate follow-up clinical studies in humans. However, I do think there are some things to take away from this regardless. One, protect your DNA. So the same habits that we use to maintain our health, like avoiding smoking, avoiding other mutagens like radioactive materials, uh, avoiding direct sun damage by using some level of ultraviolet protection, and proactively engaging in activities that maintain your genetic youth, like exercise, avoiding excess weight gain, and consuming a nutrition that helps you maintain a genetically healthy life. Two, Yamanaka factors aren't something that will be widely available, likely ever, because they have potent roles that I didn't discuss, but can be disastrous if used irresponsibly. So while those may not be viable in the near future, there are other more targeted ways of improving one's health through supplements. Surely some anti-aging supplements are worthless, but some may yet be effective. Something for me to investigate in the future, for sure. So I would focus on single outcomes like mitochondrial health, uh, energy production, and other areas that seem heavily affected. Third, of the two previous points, focusing 80% of your attention on the first will make 90% of the difference. 
I'm excited for this research to be investigated in humans, even if there are limited experiments that we can actually perform in humans. And with that, if you're interested in more science, check out the attached videos and I'll speak to you then. Bye.